a few weeks, but now you have some questions, we invite you to stop by our newcomer suite. It's right out here in our main lobby, just past the cafe. There, some volunteers will be able to answer questions that you might have. They can show you around if you'd like, and they've also got a gift for you, just as our thank you for being here with us today. If at any time while you're here, we can help you with anything at all, feel free to stop somebody in one of our Hello t-shirts. They're here to help. Thanks again for being here. We hope you and your family have a very happy Easter and a great experience here at Mountain Lake Church. One of the things I love about Mountain Lake Church is it's a place that not only tolerates the next generation, but celebrates the next generation. You know, we believe that middle schoolers and high schoolers, they've got the same problems that we do as adults, just with not as many reps in the real world to learn how to handle those problems. So it's our goal as a student ministry to prepare them to become extraordinary adults. I believe that the teenagers and middle schoolers of our church are future world changers. So if you want to know more about it, you can simply fill out that communication card or find me or one of our leaders there in the lobby. We would love to get you connected to our amazing student ministry. Well, I see that timer is running low. That means service is about to start. So for all of you guys and girls that are hanging out in the lobby, put a little bit of cream in your coffee. Hurry up. You don't want to miss a single second of what's in store for you as we celebrate Easter 2017. We're glad you're here, but it's time to hurry up and grab your seat. Hey everyone, happy Easter and welcome to Mountain Lake Church. My name is Chris Emmett, I'm the pastor here. And this is my way better half, Brianna. Hey, I'm Brianna, and we are so glad you're here. Whether this is your first time or your hundredth time, we hope you got your car parked, your kids checked in, you're sitting down, taking a deep breath. Just relax. We have a wonderful service plan for you guys. We have prayed over this weekend, and we hope that you experience Jesus in a new and a fresh way. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favor right now. If you would, would you stand up right where you're at? Go ahead and stand up and put your coffee down. Sir, you in the back, put your coffee down. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. Everybody, stand up. Take a deep breath. Tell the person next to you, Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Thank you. <laughs> Tell them Happy Easter. Let's sing and let's celebrate. Here we go. Are you ready to celebrate today? Come on, let's put our hands together. I was buried beneath my shame. could carry that kind of weight. It was my tomb till I made yeah. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried it was my dream till I made you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called
Jesus has changed you, then this is our story, the story of redemption. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, my chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the end. What a great day it is going to be celebrating all that Jesus has done as you're seeking Check out this amazing story. So we met at, um, at, in college, at Young Harris College. We were, um, you know, fell in love with each other right away. And, and um, we got married and... August, on August 3rd, 2002. We were married for five years, and then we decided that we'd like to try to have a baby, and so after about a little over a year, um, we found out we were pregnant, we were so excited. Um, I had gone to the appointment the very first time. I'd been to an appointment by myself. They do all the, you know, look at everything, and you know, look at me, basically, check me out, and then uh, come in, the nurse comes in, and she opens the file apparently for the first time from the um, anatomy screening right in front of me. And she said, oh no. And she looked at the floor and she's like, I have to get the doctor, I'm sorry, I'll be right back. And a few minutes later, the doctor came in and he said, there's there's something wrong with your baby. Um, somehow between six and 10 weeks, his abdominal wall, his, abdom his abdominal area never closed. And now most of his organs are on the outside of his body. And you need to have a specialist um, take a closer look to make sure that there aren't other things going on. Um, so, Chris was able to call and they said we we're gonna have to wait like almost two weeks to get in. Mm -hmm. So we actually somehow got in on Monday or Tuesday to see a perinatologist and he sat across the table after he'd done the ultrasound and he said, I don't know if you want to go through with this. And he was talking about not having a baby. Mm -hmm. And that was like almost well, it was harder to hear, and we were like, no, like, if we get five minutes with him, it'll all be worth it. I mean, there's... That's when, for me, God kind of started speaking to me, and that um, that was really the, the only true uh, hope I had, was that, that God would, would help us through this, because um, I felt very, you know, uh, helpless at that point. Silencing my every fear 
God of David. Do you believe that? Would you sing this? I believe in you. Yes, yes I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. Yes, you are. As we progressed through and we had uh, appointments with the perinatologist, uh, one of the big things about the this particular birth defect was it was very close to the heart and lungs. And we were just, we had to do what we had to do, is just lean on God and it's, it was just out of our control. So we did everything we we could do, like read to him and stuff. Yeah, so we read to him when he was in the belly. Um, and we prayed. We prayed a lot. Constantly. Much more than I had ever prayed in my life, honestly. We knew we were going to have a tough road when he was born, but we felt like we were doing the right thing. We really did. And I think that the more we got, you know, we were excited, and then we'd have a small setback. And we were talking about things in terms of not in our control. We're going to do what we can, but, you know, God has the wheel. And he's going to drive us through this, and we and we trusted that. So, I, so I was out in the waiting room. Um, we got the biggest operating room that they had at North at Northside. So huge OR. Um, there was, gosh, a team of people there. Um, I had the video camera strap, the regular camera strap, and the uh, the little point and shoot. So I had three cameras. I look like a tourist, but it's okay. Yeah, I wasn't going to miss. I wasn't going to miss anything. Um, <laughs> and. And so the, the surgery did go well. Um, there was a hard part, and that was um, as soon as he was born, and, the, and they made sure they was okay. They put him in a um, a carrying unit, and they wheeled him in, and I got to look at him through the glass. I didn't get to touch him. I didn't get to hold him, and then he went away to another hospital. I just wanted to be there for him. It wasn't even if I didn't get to hold him, I couldn't go with them. But I was glad that Chris got to go. And... Oh, every time I would go and, and look over him, I swear I was like almost gonna cry every time, because I was just so thankful that everything we'd gone through, that little that little baby was was there right in front of me. Couldn't believe it. But just to make it through the pregnancy and to have you know the C-section go so well um, was a huge relief for me, and I got very emotional every time I would even look at him. It just reminded me of, of God. I really did. It's amazing. I believe in you. I believe in you. You sure the God. So Easter uh, 2006, we had found out the night before that Camden would be taken off the ventilator and we were just like excited, really nervous. So around 8.15 or 8.30 a.m. they removed the ventilator and it was to be on Easter day after 17 days on the ventilator and it was a a God moment in the fact that we could see 
this miracle was happening already, even if it had ended then, even if it had, this was already a miracle. And we, our relationship with God and each other grew so much and we kind of just gave it, I mean, it, it could have torn us apart, but it didn't. And this was like, God gave us him all over again, you know? And I think I looked at Chris and I was like, okay, so he's good now. Like he's not, he's not going to have any, like when he gets older or something, but like he's been through it now. He's had his turn with bad things going well, on doctors, and suffering. The doctors say he's going to have like an insane knife scar. That he's gonna be able to be brag about for years. Yeah. For me, I was a you know somewhat negative person, pessimistic, and but when I was faced a reality of an extremely difficult situation, um, the only thing that gave me hope was my faith in God and knowing that having God there with me and me being able to pray was what got me through that situation. I don't think anyone should give up hope because God can do you know, impossible things. And we have a miracle child because of that. Let's see. Who will call all the hurting? Making perfect the tone. And who will stand through Christ our Savior, He is Jesus. Are you thankful? Who will carry our burdens and turn our sorrow to song? Who gave His life on the cross? Making right what went wrong, sing it. He is Jesus. Yes, he is. He is Jesus. Christ our Savior. He is Jesus. Yes, he is Jesus.
place tonight. Come on, church. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, please say hello to my friend, Camden. I, I thought you would like to see what a real-life miracle looks like. His mom's down here in the front row. His dad's running camera right there. And Camden will be the most popular kid in school all next week. So put your hands together one more time for Camden. Thanks, buddy. You wave. You want to... Do you want to say anything to your adoring crowd? <laughs> Hello? You know? Hi. Hi. Uh, there it is right there. Awesome. You know, I, let's see your mom right there. You ever want to jump off a stage in front of everybody? You can jump off a stage right there. Just don't hurt your ankle, please. Okay, there we go. Okay. You guys can have a seat. Thanks, man. You ever had a... Anybody tell you I've got some good news and I've got some bad news? If you've had that, just say, we have. Yeah, yeah okay. I'm going to let you know something. If you're new here, I'm just going to lay this out there. That phrase irritates the daylights out of me, personally speaking. And here's why. Because you have just essentially ruined whatever good news you're about to tell me. Right? I don't care how good the good news was. I'm worried about the bad news. And so you're going to tell me the bad news then you can tell me the good news, and I'm not going to hear that because all I'm thinking about, man, that bad news is not as bad as I thought. And so there's a lot of things going on up here. And so tonight, I've got some good news, and I've got some great news. Now, here's the good news. The good news is you made it. You made it. I know. That's a big task. I mean, getting ready for church is a chore, getting ready for church on Easter, getting everybody ready. I get it. You know, we got four kids. That's why I tell Brianna, hey, I got to go to the church early. We'll see you there. So... She handles the kids. Anyway, this is not a parenting message. This is an Easter message. So you got four kids. You got how many kids? You got got to get them busy, get them great, get them all here, and you're here, right? And you got them in child care. At least you think they're back there. You dropped them off somewhere. And and you're here, and most of you are in pretty good moods, and we're going to celebrate Easter. And so the good news is you're here. But the great news is, the great news is that we are celebrating Easter, the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and that is the greatest news on earth. And so tonight, uh, yeah, it is. It is the greatest news on earth. And so tonight, we're discussing how the greatest news on earth can forever and in dramatic way change your life and my life forever if we will let the good news of Jesus Christ sink deep into our hearts. Now, My wife has a hidden talent, and she is perfecting this talent and craft. The longer we have been married, she's getting better and better at this. And my guess is, if you're married, well, one of you in the marriage, you're really good at this, and the other, you freak out at this. And so my wife, she has this incredible talent of being able to drive her SUV until like five miles until empty. Like, she can Fred Flintstone that thing to the gas station if need be. So that's kind of, that's her thing. And an even greater talent than that, she has this incredible knack for being able to time it exactly when I go to take her car anywhere. Okay, some of you in the mayor, okay, I get this. So you get in the car, and I'm like, babe, it's like three miles. And she goes, I know, you got to get some gas. And she goes, why, I just washed the car too. And I was like, oh, man, brilliant. So... I get the gas, then I go to the car wash, and get the car wash, wash the car, go to the free vacuum place right there, and without fail, without fail, I pull up right next to the dude in the sports car that is like, he's out there, and he's got a toothbrush, and he's, you know, washing every spoke of the wheel, and it's just one of those things, he's jamming out, he's having the best day of his life. I, on the other hand, am dressed in a hazmat suit, cleaning out her SUV, and it's Chick-fil-A fries ground into the carpet and pulling it out. And I look at my SUV and I look at this guy's sports car and I go, man, this car, my car, it is a wreck. It is a mess. And I tell you that because especially if you're new to church or you haven't been in church in a while, you walk into church and it's Easter Sunday and it's easy to walk in and look around and everybody looks like they have it together. Everybody looks like their marriage is perfect. Their kids are dressed perfectly. I'm sure their finances are awesome. They must live in a great house. Everybody else looks like that proverbial sports car that is perfect. But you know your heart, your mind, your life 
Your marriage, your kids, your, your anxiety, your addictions, it is a mess. It is a wreck. And so it's easy to look at everybody else and go, nobody knows what's going on in my life. And the truth of the matter is, is this, is that all of us, whether we want to admit it or not, we are all the wrecked up, messed up SUV. We all come here with different issues, broken dysfunctionalities, and we come here and we celebrate Easter, the greatest news on earth. And tonight, we're going to look at how that news can forever change your life and mine. And if you're new to our church, we love life change stories, just like the one you saw in the video. If you walk out into our lobby, you'll see them hanging on the different pillars and columns, and we just love to, to see Jesus change lives. And for us, here's what a life change story looks like, and it's really three big buckets. It starts off with, I was, and you can fill in the blank. I was broken, I was lost, I was addicted, I was. Then the middle one is, then God. Then God showed up, then God did what only God could do. God came in my life and forever changed it. And then the next and last bucket is, now I am. Now I am healed. Now I am restored. Now I do have a new purpose. And it was, I was, then God, and now I am. And today we're going to look at a, a little bit of, of a letter that the Apostle Paul writes, and he talks about the Easter story and how we all are in a certain place, and then God, through his grace, the Easter story happens, and, and how that forever changes us. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and grab it. I need you to go to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, and if you don't have a Bible, it'll be up on the screens, and Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, and he gets to this place, and you're going to see where he talks about some things they're going through, then Paul lumps him in to, to everybody, and then he unpacks the Easter story and what happened and, and why God did that, and then he unpacks how that forever changes and shapes our lives. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 3, here's what he says. He says, all of us used to live that way following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. So Paul says, listen, we're all a mess. We're all a wreck. We've all done things to separate us from a holy God. We all have issues, we all have things, and yes, we might put on the happy face. And yes, we might look really clean and really perfect and really polished, but on the inside of our hearts and of our minds and of the depths of our soul, all of us are a mess. And Paul goes, even me, even me. He goes, I, I am in that bucket. So all of us are the proverbial, wrecked up, messed up SUV. And we come in here and we come to celebrate Easter. And this is the good news, the greatest news that he unpacks starting in verse 4. Verse 4 says, but God, and here's where the good news comes in. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. He says, we're all a mess, we're, we're all a wreck. He says, but God, but God in his grace and God in his mercy and God in his love, he made a way and reminds us of the Easter story. And he says, he raised Christ Jesus from the dead. And when he did that, he gave us life. And so why do Christians all over the globe gather on Easter weekend? We gather on Easter weekend because it is a beautiful and profound reminder to us of the greatest news on earth. And here's the simple reminder that Easter gives us. Easter reminds us that God gave us life by conquering death. God gave you life by conquering death. God gave me life by conquering death. And so it's springtime and you drive around and you see flowers beginning to bloom and it's new life. 
You see the trees are getting their leaves in its new life. You go to your garden and you see new shrubs and new flowers in its new life. And Easter is a beautiful reminder that God in his grace and his love and his kindness for you gave you life by raising Christ Jesus from the dead. And so here's what we can pull from that is that God is in control of both life and death and everywhere in between. God, who gave us life by conquering death, means God is in charge of life, God is in charge of death at both ends of the spectrum, and he is in complete control of everything in between. And so the simple question we must all wrestle with is this, is why would you not give God complete control of your life? The God of the universe who's in control of life, who's in control of death, who's in control of everything in between, and you've got some addiction, some anxieties, your marriage, your kids, your job, whatever it is, you're going, I'm not so sure. And Easter reminds us that God gave us life by raising Christ Jesus from the dead. So if he's in charge of life, and he's in charge of death, and he's in charge of everything in between, why in the world? Would you not give the God of the universe full and complete control of your life? Ten years ago, my dad turned 50, and at that time, my younger brother was 18. And for years leading up to that, they had always said that when my younger brother was 18, my dad turned 50 for his 50th birthday, those two, they would go skydiving what they wanted to do. And they talked about three or four years. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. Well, my brother was 18. It was my dad's 50th birthday. They had planned it. They were going to go. And the week of, one of them called me and was like, you don't want to go skydiving with us, do you? And, uh, you know, I don't want to be the chicken brother or son. So I was like, yeah, I'll go. And they're like, okay, we're going this Saturday. I was like, okay, great. So they had been planning this for years. You know, a few days out, I was like, yeah, why not? How hard can it be? So we show up Saturday, and, and, and if you've got a brother or you've got a dad, when you get a dad and, and sons or brothers around, there's a lot of trash talking that goes on. Like any sporting events, and it came to parachuting, we're, we're driving out there, I'm going to do three flips out of the airplane, I'm going to do four flips, oh, it's going to be great. And, and so we go, and you train for about an hour, and, and you kind of go through the things, and the, the instructor, he says, hey, I'm going to be strapped to you, and here's what's going to happen and everything, and so we're talking trash and everything. Anyway, we fly up in the airplane, and we get to about the 10,000 foot level, and, and then all of a sudden, the door opens up, and it gets real quiet. Because all of a sudden, they look out, and there's the clouds. Everybody gets just dead quiet. And so my brother, he's going first. He's at the edge. The instructor's strapped to the back of him. And so he jumps out, and they spin, and they fall. And parachute opens, and they start floating down. And then my dad, he gets to the edge. The instructor's strapped to the back of him. He jumps out, and he falls, and parachute opens up, and they start floating down. Then it's my turn. And I get to the edge, and the instructor's strapped on the back of me. He goes, you ready? And I was like, <laughs> I guess, sure, go ahead. And so we jump, and so we jump, and we roll down there, and he pulls the parachute. Now, this was my first time skydiving, so I didn't want to complain too much, but it felt like we were falling a lot faster than I thought we should have. <laughs> but again, you know, I don't want to be the, you know, the, the jerk new guy, so I was like, you know, it just feels like we're falling, we're just falling, it's real loud and windy and everything, and all this thought is going through my head, and I was like, I'm sure it's fine. And so we're falling, and all of a sudden, I hear the instructor yell at me, he goes, hang on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going anywhere, you know, whatever you got to do. I, 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 you know, and then I tried to be polite, and I thought, you know, should I offer to help or do some things? I was like, no, I'll just stay here, just stay here. He goes, he goes hang on. I was like, okay. And uh, it, the toggle cords had gotten wrapped around the parachute, and the parachute was not opening. So he goes, hang on. So he takes the toggle cords, spins them the opposite way, and all of a sudden, pff, the parachute opens, and we float down, and we land, and I change my pants and go on about my day. <laughs> Don't judge, you'd be changing your pants too if you were doing that. <laughs> so, so we landed, and I just remember this conversation, like we landed and everything and talking to my brother and dad, and I asked the guy, I was like, man, what, what would have happened like if you wouldn't have gotten that open? And he goes, oh, it's not that big a deal. And I'm like, really? It kind of seems like a big deal. And he's like, no, 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 we would have cut the parachute loose. We had a secondary chute. And I was like, oh my goodness. So I, 
I tell you that. I tell you that. Because if I got up here and told you that story, and then the story went like this. We were falling. The instructor said, hang on. I said, no, 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 dude. I'll take care of it. I'm falling 10,000 feet to my death. I've never parachuted a day in my life. But you know what? I'll figure it out. There's the instructor, there's the pro who has jumped thousands upon thousands of times. There's an issue going on. And if I had said, I'll figure this out, you'd be going, you're the biggest idiot I've ever seen. And I'm surprised I still see you after that. But how many times do we tell the God of the universe who's in control of life and death, I got it. I got it. Your marriage is falling apart. I'll figure it out. Your finances are out of control. I'm sure it'll work its way out. You've got this addiction you can't overcome. Oh, I'll just will my way out of it. It's not that big of a deal. We go, God, I know you're in charge of life, and I know you're in charge of death, but you know what? I think I'll figure this out on my own. Easter's a beautiful reminder that God gave us life by conquering death. He's in charge of both life and death and everything in between. How much longer will you continue to keep that area of your life for your own control rather than giving it over to the one who is in full and complete control? Paul goes, we're all a mess, but God in his grace made a way, giving his life by conquering death. Now, here's what that means, and here's how our life gets forever changed. Finish up in verse 8. Paul says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. Look at verse 10. He says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Paul says, we're all a mess. You know that, right? He goes, we're all this. But, but God, he reminds us of the Easter story. And he goes, and when you place your faith in Jesus, he creates you anew. And he creates you into something beautiful, something called a masterpiece. And he says, it's all because of God's grace, not because of anything that you have done, but because of something that he did by raising Christ Jesus from the dead. And when that happens, he gives you life and says, you are now a masterpiece. And so if you hear nothing else, if you hear nothing else this Easter, I just want you to grasp this simple idea. We are all a mess, but the grace of God creates a masterpiece. We're all a mess. We're all that dirty, nasty SUV that nobody wants to look at. We're all that. But the grace of God, by raising Christ Jesus from the dead, gives us life. And when you accept that, when you believe in that, he says, now you are a masterpiece. You are something that is beautiful, something that is highly valued, something that is priceless. I want you to go with me in your imagination for just a minute. I'm just going to throw out a scenario that I'm pretty sure would never, ever happen in your life. But just let's pretend it does. Let's say in about a week or so, the head officials in Paris call you. And they're like, hey, you know what? We think the Mona Lisa has been over here long enough. We're tired of having it over here. We would like to display it in the breakfast nook of your house. What do you think about that? And you're going, what? And they're like, yeah, you know, it's been good. It's had a good run over here. But we just think for the next year, it should really, the lighting in your breakfast nook is so unbelievable. We just think it should be there. You're going, oh, my goodness, yes, bring it over. So a week goes by, and they bring it over, and it's sitting there in your breakfast. Let me tell you what you're going to think about that Mona Lisa. First of all, you're going to look at it and go, it is beautiful. You're going to see why millions of people every year go to see it. It is an unbelievably beautiful painting. You're going to look at it and go, this is priceless. Like, there is no price or, or any value that could, you could place on it. You're looking at it going, this is the Mona Lisa hanging in my breakfast nook. And then the third thing, you're going to look at it and go, it is extremely valuable. You're going to invite all your friends and family members. There's going to be a long line of cars waiting to get in to see the Mona Lisa because it is simply a masterpiece. And when you understand the way, that's the way the God of the universe views you. When you understand that you come here feeling a mess, and we all do, because you look at 
your marriage and you look at your family and you look at your finances and you look at your anxiety and you look at your addictions that nobody else knows about, you look at all these things, you go, man, I'm a wreck. I'm, I'm a complete mess. And God goes, yes, but my grace covers a multitude of sins, a multitude of your issues. And because of my grace that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, they, God says, when you believe all that thing that you consider a mess, I view as a masterpiece. And so many of you come in here holding on to something, white-knuckling something that you've yet to give God full control of. And God's going, if you'll just, if you'll give it to me, if you'll trust me with it, that thing that you're holding on to that is honestly a mess and everybody else knows it, all of a sudden, it begins to become something beautiful and something priceless and something of great value. It becomes a masterpiece because of the grace of God. So I don't know what your faith background is. I don't know what your church background is, but I'm just a simple preacher here in the North Georgia area, and I'm here to tell you that the God of the universe loves you and cares for you, and because of his grace and his mercy and his love for you, he raised Christ Jesus from the dead. It's the greatest news on earth, and all he says is, if you will believe in Jesus Christ and what happened that first Easter morning, he says, you will be saved and you are considered a masterpiece. I brought something up here today that if you're a parent, you probably have thousands of these. And this is a little piece of artwork that my daughter Kara did. And I think it was like at her preschool or something. But it's, it's nothing really to look at. In fact, it's kind of falling apart and it's been torn and taped back together. And, and you get this. If you're a parent, you've, you've got thousands of these, whether from the preschool or, or if you bring your kids here, we, we let them make all sorts of art and give it to you to take home. And... Uh, you don't really want to throw it away because you're like, that's holy art. I'm not sure what we should do with it. And so you just, <laughs> just pile it up. And so you don't know. What to, but you have things like this. And, 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 I, and I brought Kara's here. And again, it's, it's really nothing pretty to look at if I gave it to you. And it's nothing that you're going to hang in, in your breakfast nook. But it's valuable to me. And let me just show you her little piece of artwork. And I'll tell you why. It says, I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Kara, I am, but I would eat butter on a house. <laughs> and that little green thing is the house, and that blue thing is the stick of butter on the house. So I, I tell you that because, first of all, this is truth. Kara loves butter. That's her favorite snack. And so she'll probably be 40 years old, still living at home, and I'm fine with that. So, but, but this is hers. Now, if I gave this to you after East, after the service, I, I gave it to you, you would probably be polite and go, oh, thank you so much. And, and you'd probably keep it at least to the car and then throw it away when you got to the house and go, why did you give that to me? Does that make any sense to you? It's, it's not all that valuable to you. You don't think it's all that pretty. But for me, I think it's beautiful. And I think it's valuable. I would consider it a masterpiece. And it's not because of what's on there, but it's because of who made it. It's considered a masterpiece, not because of, of what it is, but because of, of who created it. And when you understand that you're considered a masterpiece, not because of what you have done, but because of whose you are, because you're created anew in Christ Jesus. And so the good news of Jesus, the great news of Jesus is simply that he accepts you as you are when you place your faith in him and says, you're a masterpiece, now do the things that I've called you to do. And so many times we buy into this lie going, well, I got to do this and I got to do this and I got to make sure I, I go here. And when all these things happen, then God says you're good. And God goes, no, you're a mess, you're a wreck, you'll always be a mess and a wreck without the grace of God. He goes, so no, I know you're a mess, and I know you're a wreck, but I accept you as you're at, and I consider you not just good, but beautiful and a masterpiece. And he goes, because of that, now you do the things that God's called you to do. Now you respond out of that. Now you obey out of that. You don't obey to that. You obey because God says you're good, and you're a masterpiece, and because I raised my son Christ Jesus from the dead, I consider you a new person when you place your faith in him. And when that happens, all of a sudden, this light bulb should come on and go, the God of the universe, 
in control of life and in control of death and everything in between views my mess and my wrecked up life as a masterpiece. And then because of that, you begin to do the things that God has called you to do. So there's really two ways to respond to this. The first is there are some of you here in this room that you have never wrestled to the ground in your heart and your soul your salvation. Like what happens to you when you die? There's just a big question mark there at the end. And people have talked to you about it and just go, I'll deal with it later. I'll deal with it later. I'll deal with it later. Maybe you go to a funeral and it comes back to the top of your mind and you go, I'll deal with it later. And you come to church and because somebody invited you or bribed you with a dinner, I don't know how you got here, but you're here. And all of a sudden it comes to the top of your mind and you're about to say, I'll deal with it later. And I would just encourage you, deal with it now. There's no better time to deal with your eternity than today. And again, I'm just a very simple preacher here in North Georgia, but I can just tell you that the God of the universe loves you and cares for you and made a way by sending his son Jesus to the earth to live a perfect life, to die for your sins and mine, and three days later brought him back from the grave and gave you life by conquering death when you place your faith in his son Jesus. So there's some of you here today that that need to wrestle to the ground your eternity, your salvation, and that is done simply by believing in Jesus and what happened on that Easter morning. Then there's a second group of you. You are saved. You have placed your faith in Jesus. You know that, but boy, you are holding on to something so tight. You're white-knuckling something so tight, and you know you should give God control, but you haven't. There's that area in your life you're going, I'll give God everything but this. Whatever that is. It's your marriage, it's your reputation, it's what's going on at your job, it's how how you treat people, it's your purpose in life. It's that anxiety, it's that secret addiction that nobody knows about. You're just going, I'll figure it out, I'll figure it out myself. And your life is spinning out of control at a thousand miles an hour. The God of the universe is saying, I'm here to help. And you're going, I got it. And maybe tonight you just need to go, God, I don't. God, whatever that is, it's yours. And I've trusted you, Jesus, I know that, but for whatever reason, I've held on too tight. And tonight, Jesus, I give you full and complete control. We're all a mess, but the grace of God, the grace Christ Jesus from the dead, calls us a masterpiece when we place our faith in his son, Jesus. Considers you beautiful, priceless, and of high value. It's the greatest news of the Easter story. Let me pray for us. I have your head bowed and every eye closed. Again, I don't know what your story of faith is. I don't know what brought you here tonight. But for those of you here in this room that you are not a Christian, you've never wrestled to the ground, what happens to you when you die? Again, it would be probably pretty easy for you to go, I'll deal with it later, but I'm telling you, deal with it now. Deal with it now. And I know you probably have been offended by other Christians and by other preachers, and and for that, I'm sorry, but what's important is between you and Jesus, not between you and me, not between you and the person that brought you, but between you and Jesus. And tonight, if you would simply place your faith in him and the fact that he went to the cross for your sins and the fact that God did raise him from the dead, if you would place your faith in him, and I don't care if you've never opened up a single page of the Bible, but you're going, man, tonight I'm ready. Tonight I'm ready to believe in Jesus for the very first time. And I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. And what's really important about this prayer is what's going on the inside of your heart. If you're ready to trust Jesus, just say something like this. Mean it from the depths of your heart. Just say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And without you, I cannot get into heaven. So come into my heart and be Lord of my life from this day forward. Now, for those of you in this room that you know you're a Christian, but you've been holding on to something so tight, tonight it's time to give that control of that area over to Jesus. 
It's time to give that area of control over to the one who's in control of life and death and everything in between. And say, I'm, I'm tired of trying to fix it myself. I'm tired of trying to pull myself up by my own bootstraps and work my way out of it. Tonight, Jesus, this and fill in the blank, whatever it is, is yours. And if that's you, just say something like this. Just say, Jesus, for far too long, I've tried to control, and you fill in the blank with whatever it is. And tonight, Jesus, on Easter of 2017, I give you full and complete control of whatever the thing is. Father, I pray for all of us here in this room. For those in this room that have trusted you for the very first time and have found salvation and have literally moved from death unto life. God, I thank you for them. And God, for those here in this room that have for far too long have held on to that thing and they know exactly what I'm talking about for far too long, Lord, my prayer is that Easter 2017 is that day that they will remember for the rest of their lives that they gave that thing over to you today and every day for the rest of their lives. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for being here today. We ask these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Now, here's how I'm going to ask that you would respond to that. I'm not going to ask that you would raise your hand or stand up or come down front. I, I, here's what I'm going to ask. Is that if you said that prayer for salvation and like you literally moved from death to life, or maybe that prayer for you was, you know what, I'm a Christian, but there's that thing that has been controlling my heart and my life. If that's you, I'm going to ask after the service is over, there are some canvases out there in our lobby. There's five of them. And they spell Jesus, J-E-S-U-S. And we've got paint brushes. And I would just simply ask that you would go out there and that you would paint your name, just your first name. And just as a symbol for you to say, you know what? This area of my life that I've controlled, or maybe my, my whole life for the first time, I'm giving it over to Jesus. And just paint your name on there, and it may take a little bit, but it's a moment for you to go, you know what? Today, Easter 2017, I gave my life to Jesus for the very first time, or that thing that I've been grasping on to control of, I finally let go. And you just go out there and you paint your first name. And then we have baptisms going on out there in our courtyard, and and if you've trusted Jesus for the first time, that's the next thing to do. You're going, well, I didn't come wearing a swimsuit or anything. They've got clothes out there for you. Just go out there and say, you know what? I'm ready to tell the whole world that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. There's going to be people out there cheering for you and clapping for you. And so it, it's that moment. Or maybe you've never been baptized. You go, man, that's, that's something I need to do. There's going to be people out there. We'd love to baptize you, but stick around and celebrate. It, it's visible life change. For us to see, I was, then God, and now I am. Here's how we're going to end our Easter service. We're going to sing a song, and it talks about the death, burial, and resurrection. So I'm going to ask that you would stand up right where you're at. And I would love that you would just sing this song at the top of your lungs about the greatest news on earth. Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all the Oh,
done for us by sending his son Jesus for me and for you it gives us something to sing about today right the hope that we have in Jesus Christ is what brings us redemption forgiveness and life through Jesus through him and him alone come on let me hear you sing it for his glory and his name oh that happened today, the life changed stories that are being written right here in this moment. The Bible tells us in moments like these that all of heaven is rejoicing. So let's give God a shout of praise one more time. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for worshiping with us. Don't be in too hurry to get out of here and go have dinner. Stick around, see some people get baptized. We got the egg dash for the kids and we hope to see you next Sunday right here as we kick off our new series, God Used To. You're dismissed. Happy Easter. Thomas was a doubter. Sarah was impatient. Noah got drunk. Ruth was a foreigner. David, he had an affair. Peter had a temper. Martha was a worrier. Miriam was a gossip. 